Before I installed my electric sailboat motor, I looked for relevant how-to videos on YouTube. I expected to find loads of them. I found a few videos showing the end result, which was helpful, but there wasn't much showing the many steps from start to finish. This won't be a complete how-to video, because it couldn't be. There are lots of different boats out there, and quite a few different electric motors to choose from. The purpose of this video is to explain the bigger steps required to install an electric motor in a sailboat. Specifically, this is about a shaft drive installation, where your propeller is driven by a prop shaft that passes into your boat through a stuffing box or dripless shaft seal. There it is coupled to the side of your engine's gearbox. More specifically, this is a Thunderstruck Motors Kit installation. If your boat is equipped with sail drive, then the process will be different. I will use images and footage from my own installation, as well as videos from YouTube. Links to those videos, as well as other videos or web pages that I thought would be useful, are in the description. For the purposes of this video, I've split the tasks as follows. Choose your equipment, brace the prop shaft, remove coupler, remove engine, install motor mount, align shaft, install batteries and other electronics, install motor, do a victory lap, paying for it, the cost of electrifying. Choose your equipment. We'll assume you have made your decision and no one is going to change your mind. Next, you need to choose the kit or parts for your install. The big ticket items are the motor and batteries, but you'll need other items too. Low gauge cables, battery charger, a charge controller and or BMS if they're not included with your batteries. And if you don't buy a kit, you'll need a motor controller and fuses and all the other little things that come in a kit. Motor kit. For my 30-foot Catalina 30 sailboat, I chose to install the 10-kilowatt sailboat motor kit, as well as the gear reduction motor mount from Thunderstruck Motors. They have 5, 10, 12, 14, and 18 to 24 kilowatt options. For a throttle, I chose the wigwag so I could easily place it anywhere I wanted. But if you're happy with the position of your current throttle, you have the option of getting the Curtis throttle adapter that connects to your existing lever. I also bought the CAN translator from Thunderstruck Motors. With it, I can use the OBD2 Bluetooth scan tool, that thing they use in the garage to talk to your car, to get all the power usage data from my motor controller. So like voltage, amperage, and power use, that sort of thing. If you're ordering a Thunderstruck kit, I recommend you add this to your cart, especially if you're an international shopper, since you must pay via old school wire transfer, and you won't want to pay for that again if you later decide you want the module. To use it, you need an OBD2 Bluetooth scan tool. I got mine from Amazon. There were tons of them with big price differences. I don't know if mine is any good, but I'll find out, I guess. The gear reduction motor mount made it easier to install the motor. The reason for changing the gear ratio of your electric motor is the same reason it's done for diesel or gas engines. That is, to match the maximum RPM of your motor to the RPM of your propeller when your boat is moving at its maximum speed, which will pretty much be hull speed. For an electric install, there are some nice side benefits as well. A handy motor mount is one, a built-in thrust bearing is another. But if you're planning to mount the motor directly, you probably need a thrust bearing since electric motors are not always designed to support the weight of the prop shaft directly. So far, I'm happy with my motor kit. You might be looking for another kit if shipping is too high to your location or something. In that case, a good place to start is a website called plugboats.com. They have a huge list of marine motors. It doesn't list Thunderstruck, I don't know why. All these links are in the video description. Another link you'll find there is a playlist for a Golden Motors install. The last three videos on that playlist show the final motor mount install. It's custom though, so if you don't have a shop, they might not help. Still, they are interesting. Another, perhaps surprising option, might be an e-bike motor. Grin Motors, located in Vancouver, BC, Canada, is an e-bike motor company that has started working on a sailboat motor kit. They've installed their motor with a customized winding to match prop RPM in a 25-foot sailboat and they've done a test voyage across the Georgia Strait in the Salish Sea, motoring from Vancouver, BC to Vancouver Island, BC, some 50 nautical miles, which is 90 kilometers. They've started a pilot program looking for people that are planning to convert a sailboat to electric. You do need to be in the Vancouver area, however, and I have no details. I'm saying this in May of 2022. Check out the link in the description. Next is batteries. For my install, I chose EG4 batteries from Signature Solar. I purchased two 100 amp hour, 51.2 volt, 48 volt nominal, waterproof lithium iron phosphate batteries with built-in BMS. The two batteries combined come to 10.24 kilowatt hours. They have a recommended constant discharge of 30 amps 
and a max constant discharge of 100 amps each for a total of 60 amps and 200 amps respectively. In my sailboat, it is very unlikely they will spend much time near 200 amps, but it is nice to have the option. I chose the waterproof version in part because they were available and the regular packs were not. They were $150 more each, so $300 in total. The fact that they are waterproof is nice though, and it made them easier to install, as you'll see later. They have a Bluetooth connection to read battery status. The app is quite basic, it doesn't log info, and though the iOS version is available on the App Store, the Android version must be sideloaded. I have no idea why. A negative is that the batteries are not CAN bus controlled, which might limit things for you if that's important. I am so far quite happy with the batteries. As you can see, there's quite a few options available. There are many sources for batteries. These ones come with a five-year warranty. They claim to have a 15-year life, and that assumes you're going to discharge down to 20%, 80% depth of discharge, and then fully charge them every single day. Only time will tell if this is true. But their price was the best I'd found at the time. If you know of other possibly better options, mention them in the comments. I'm keeping my 12-volt house bank for now, since it was already installed. But when those batteries need to be replaced, I expect I'll just remove them. I've already bought a DC to DC step down converter to use the motor bank for house power. Now that you've chosen and ordered your gear, it's time to start preparing for the install. In order to install your new electric motor, you'll need to remove your old engine. Before you do that, you need to brace your prop shaft. That way you know that your prop shaft is aligned at least as well as it was with your old engine. To brace your prop shaft, you can use two parts, a cross brace of some sort and a loop or hook piece that grips the prop shaft. I'd use plywood. First install the cross brace, then position the loop around the shaft and anchor it to the brace. Make sure there's no tension in the loop so that when the coupler is removed, the prop shaft doesn't move to release that tension. If you have something rigid like plywood, you probably won't have a ton of tension, but you still should be careful. When you are removing the coupler, you may need to slide the shaft in and out. Use a marker and mark the shaft's position on the brace so that you can position it correctly afterwards. You want to maintain the proper distance between your propeller and your hull. Later on, once the engine has been removed, you'll need to make sure to wrap the prop shaft and brace to remove any wiggle room. Once you start aligning the motor to the shaft, you don't want it changing position. If it's too late, you already removed your engine and you didn't brace your prop shaft, you can recenter and brace it now. If you're out of the water, you can remove your stuffing box or shaft seal and visually center the shaft, then brace it. If you're in the water, you could find the range of movement of your prop shaft and center it that way. This will cause your dripless seal to splash water all over, but maybe not drip. The next step is removing the coupler. I had to replace my prop shaft because it was badly worn at the cutlass bearing. I had to cut it free of the coupler because it was a rusted mess and I couldn't loosen the set bolts. So I don't have any video of me taking it apart the way you'll probably need to do it. But I did find this video from SKIDIM that shows how to remove the coupler from your prop shaft. There's a link in the description to this video and a couple others. If you are removing your coupler, I suggest watching them. One of the videos mentions that though this technique worked for them, they heard afterwards that it can damage your coupler if you have to crank too hard on the bolts to release it. So be warned, if you use this method, be aware that you might damage the coupler, which could reduce the value of your engine on Craigslist. If you haven't already, make sure to mark the position of the prop shaft before you slide it out of position. This way you won't change the position of your propeller to be closer or further from the hull than it needs to be. Next is removing the engine. With the prop shaft removed, you need to remove all the other cables, hoses, and wires connecting the engine to the boat. Last, you remove the motor mount nuts. Mine gave me plenty of sass, but with some help from my friends, Dave and Glenn, we prevailed over that cheeky inanimate hardware. Once we'd removed everything holding the engine in place, we attached the wooden rack with many straps. Then we hoisted it from the boat with raw meat power. Go humans! This was practical for us since I had such a small diesel, 11 horsepower Universal 5411. But many, perhaps most sailboats, have larger engines. If in doubt, ask your local boatyard and they will yoink your engine up and out with ease. For a presumably reasonable fee, obviously. Bonus step, sell your engine to the highest bidder. Next, it's time to install the motor mount. Uh, at this point, you do need your motor kit, obviously. If you're lucky, your engine will have been mounted on sloped stringers. In that case, you may be able to reuse a couple motor mounts, or buy new ones, and simply mount the motor bracket on top of the stringers. The YouTube channel Sailing Ixian had such a setup, and their install went smoothly. And they have the same year, or very close, to my boat. But they had an Atomic 4, and my 5411 was different. My stringers were too tall for that method. 
I chose to cut them on an angle close to the same angle as the prop shaft. Because there was a lot of material to remove, I used my drill with a large bit to put holes in the stringer. I made the holes different depths, shallow where I was grinding shallow and deep where I was grinding deep. It reduced the material I had to grind away and also served as a guide to how deep I needed to grind. After grinding the stringers down to the appropriate height, I put a layer of fiberglass to protect the wood. It was in good shape after 40 years and I wanted it to stay in good shape. I have a series of videos showing almost every step as I installed my motor. If you're looking for more visual details before you start your own project or you're just interested, check them out. A link to the playlist is in the description. Cutting my stringers wasn't enough. I still couldn't use the old motor mounts because they were still too tall. So I made my own mounts from strips of stainless steel. If you're cutting or drilling stainless steel, the advice I received from the shop I purchased my steel from was to go slow and use lots of oil. Heat is your enemy. Stainless steel will harden easily and then your cutting blades and bits will break. Once the stringers were prepared, installing the mount was not difficult. I managed to drill the holes where they needed to be, but if this had been a proper mount, it would have had slotted holes in the bracket to allow adjustment from side to side. There are other ways this could have been done. If you used or know of a different method, mention it in the comments. While you're at it, click like and subscribe and click the bell because you don't want to miss any of this super high quality content. Next, you align the motor and prop shafts together. Aligning the shafts can be finicky and tedious. For me, it was also a source of doubt. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it. The truth is, it just takes some time. You keep at it, making adjustments, and then checking to see if it's better. Then you make more adjustments and do more checking. I used a driver bit like this, but longer. It was long and straight and had a hexagonal shape, giving it a flat edge to hold against the prop shaft to see if the motor mount shaft was in line. I started with bare shafts. You have to check all sides over and over and over. Good lighting here will help. My lighting was not great and it slowed me down. Adjusting my mount was done with the four bolts. It took some trial and error to figure it out. First I tried to get the mount to the correct angle. After that, whenever I made an adjustment, I needed to raise or lower all of the nuts so that the angle would be maintained. Once you have the two shafts paired up, you can add the coupler. In my case, I had the Thunderstruck coupler in which the two sides are connected by a chain. My prop shaft was very slightly oversized by design to form a friction fit with the coupler. So to get the coupler onto my prop shaft, I had to heat it up enough to expand it. I used the oven at home, then transported the coupler double wrapped to the boat. If you do this, be very, very careful. The coupler holds and retains a lot of energy. If it touches you, it will burn you and it will not stop burning you until it stops touching you. I was amazed at how easily it fit into place when I connected the two shafts with the coupler. Don't forget to screw in the retaining bolts to keep the coupler in place. Alternately, you could attach the two coupler ends separately before aligning them. This may be the method they intended, but I never found any instructions for this, so I'm just guessing based on how Sailing Ixion finished theirs. If you're using a more traditional shaft coupler setup, then there are plenty of videos on how to fine tune the alignment. Boats move around a lot, so the motor needs to be cross braced. The kit didn't come with a cross brace, so I made some from quarter inch thick strips of stainless steel. That might be more than it needs. Next is the battery installation. Because my batteries are waterproof, I didn't feel the need to build a full box. You may need a full enclosure if you have different batteries. This is another area where each boat will need a unique solution. Whatever your battery setup, unless you're from the future, it will be heavy. You need to strap it down. There are regulations to guide you. The video of my install is a bit dark, but it shows how many steps can be involved with adding something like this to a fiberglass boat. Next is the electronics and motor installation. If you're installing the same Thunderstruck motor that I was, attaching the motor is as simple as just doing it. There's a handy bolt catch that allows you to keep the motor in place with one bolt, so you only need to hold it in place long enough to thread that bolt. Installing the electronics is something that will be different in most boats. The motor controller, contactor, battery charger, and charge controller need to be mounted somewhere. When you're choosing your placement, be mindful of short circuit hazards and follow ABYC guidelines for marine wiring. There's a link in the description to bluesea.com with cable size per amp information. Make sure all of your connections are covered and choose the right sized cables. For my installation, I used single zero gauge from my batteries to the motor controller. 
but your setup might be different. With all the major components in place, wiring things up enough for a test was trivial. The instructions were clear on where to plug in each cable. And the zipper's turning. Wow. Installing the throttle was more time consuming since I wanted it on the steering column and I needed to make a box to place it there. If you're using the Curtis throttle attached to your existing lever setup, you will have to figure out where to mount that. I'm guessing it will be easy to figure out. I'm also guessing it will be a pain in the b-hole to actually install. The last step is to install the smaller pulley hub and attach the belt. There's a tapered and split inner hub. This fits on the shaft with the rectangular key in place and the outer hub fits over top. Put it loosely together, including the three bolts which go into the unthreaded holes of the inner hub to the threaded holes of the outer hub. I put the belt on at the same time since it looked like it was going to be a very tight fit getting it attached afterwards. I imagine it's designed to be able to change out the belt from time to time, but this belt seemed very tight. You slide the pulley hub onto the motor shaft with the bolts on the inside. Yes, this is a bit awkward. Use a straight edge to make sure the small hub you are installing is lined up with the larger hub that is already attached to the motor mount. Then the three bolts are tightened in sequence. Keep tightening them one after the other with an open-ended wrench until they are tight. Once they are tightened enough, the inner and outer hub will act as one. If they are loose, they will not act as one and things can shear off. If you're not installing a Thunderstruck motor or there is a different version, you will have a different process here, obviously. Next, it's time for a victory lap. Once you're happy with your install and have tested the motor a bit while tied up to the dock, then take your boat out for a spin, probably just, you know, a short one at first, and maybe bring along a few deckhands with long sticks in case you screwed up one step or another. I've shared a Google spreadsheet that I'll be updating from time to time. It has data about, you know, motor usage and energy usage and all that. I don't currently have any wind speed sensors though, so until I do, the value of the information will be limited to calm days. A common question that you might be asking is, how far can I go on a charge? And if you've looked for the answer before, you probably already know that the answer begins with, it depends. There's no straight answer because, even more than with electric cars, boat range is affected by speed and environment. A rough guide is that every additional knot of speed will require twice the power of your current speed. Two knots takes twice the power of one knot, three knots twice the power of two, 4 takes twice the power of 3, and so on. If you want to travel everywhere at hull speed, you won't get far. But if you're okay with 3 or 4 knots, things start to look much better. Wind and current are also big factors, just as they are with diesel and gas engines. My 200 amp hour 48 volt battery bank has just over 10 kilowatt hours. I have a 10 kilowatt motor, so in theory it could run at full power for an hour before the batteries were drained to zero. I've been out several times now and I generally run at 2 kilowatts, which would mean that after 4 hours my batteries would be drained down to 20%. If I drain them to zero, I should be able to motor for 5 hours. Most of the time, at 2 kilowatts of power, I'm traveling between 3 and 4 knots, depending on wind and current. Of course, if the wind is higher, the boat will slow considerably. But in that case, I should be sailing anyway. In my case, I don't worry about range. Since my dinghy's outboard motor, which can be attached to my sailboat directly, can easily push my boat at hull speed, so I can rely on it if I need to. So far in my trips, I haven't ever drained the batteries below 50%. Here are the costs that I've recorded from uh, the installation. There were probably bits here and there that I missed somehow, so, you know, add a few dollars on for, uh, for that. I put a note at the bottom, you'll see, uh, the price of Thunderstruck motor kit has gone up, like lots of things have, but at uh, the time of this video, uh, the batteries haven't changed price. Obviously, the batteries and the uh, motor kit were the most expensive bits, but there were, there were a few other things that added up as well. So I hope this video has been some use to you, um, or entertaining, or uh, you're probably not listening anymore. I'll be continuing to upload videos of sailing and or ROV diving and or electric sailboat motoring 
as well as any modifications I do to my boat, which I have many planned. We'll see how many see the light of day. Thanks for watching. If you uh, like the video, then maybe click the button that says that. And uh, if you want to see more, then click subscribe. You know, you know, you've watched YouTube videos before. This is the part where I remind you. I used to think that was dumb until uh, I started clicking like and subscribing to people's videos because they reminded me. <laughs> Bye.